Lauren Southern, how my trad life turned toxic. The online ideology doesn't work in the real world. This is from a few days ago. Uh, I guess three or four days ago. Of course, I saw it circulating. Then I saw its length, and I was like, I really want to read this on air. And so I just kind of skipped over it. But uh, it kind of fits in with tonight's guest. Um, if you want to interrupt it, please feel free. Uh, but... Does promoting marriage and motherhood inevitably make women easy targets for subordinate status, increase vulnerability, and a return to second-class status? On one of the very first columns I wrote at Unheard back in 2019, I described how for me, becoming a mom meant giving up on a great deal of the liberal ideology I'd embraced when younger because it was impossible to square with the embodied reality of caring for a baby. A relatively conventional home life turned out to be much more fulfilling than the radical one I'd adopted, adopted with my progressive politics. My accounts of questioning this individualistic ideology and embracing marriage and motherhood have resonated with social, social conservatives. Most of these, it goes without saying, feel, as I do, that family life and women's distinctive sexed realities should be better understood and valued in the public conversation. Some, though, take more hardline positions that women should never work, for example, that we should always be submissive, or even that women's right to vote, women's right to vote should be repealed. I never heard about that one. Who said that? Who said that? Oh, really? I didn't know that up uh, in the chat. Uh, but surely any stance which risks lending momentum to such extreme arguments cannot be in women's interests. I recently, or I explored this question recently with the Canadian right-wing firebrand Lauren Southern. I'm not sure if I would call her that anymore, anymore, but whose early video content regularly challenged liberal feminist orthodoxy and promoted domest domesticity. Uh, our stories are symmetrical in some respects. Both of us embraced radical politics in our early 20s, me on the left and Southern on the right. Both of us embraced ideologies that felt inspiring in the free-floating world of the Internet. And both of us, albeit in different ways, have course-corrected back toward reality in part via the fiercely practical experience of caring for a child. Soren's Southern story might easily serve as a cautionary tale for how socially conservative talking points can lead women into danger. For where I lost my 20s to commune life and niche sexualities, she left media at 22 to embrace a socially conservative template for women. The lifestyle, lifestyle often idealized by social media influencers as trad wife. Except it wasn't all 50s pinafores and cupcakes. Pinafores? I don't really know that word. but It was a living hell. A living hell. Nor, as she has learned, was she the only conservative woman in this position. Compar comparing our experiences, though, by the way, she married an Australian federal agent uh, and, uh, you know, up uprooted her whole life uh, and moved to Australia. But, uh, you know, we'll leave that aside for now. But uh, two things emerge. Firstly, that this is not simply a matter of the right being uniquely toxic for women, though a Southern story reveals there's plenty of scope for toxicity. It's rather that purist ideologies such as such map at best uneasily onto the practical realities of life as a woman, and especially as a mother. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And secondly, that the simplifying, polarizing incentives baked into the contemporary internet are increasingly warping the ideologies of both left and right into to such extreme forms that any sincere effort to apply these in real life will almost inevitably be the stuff of nightmares. Southern was perhaps the most telege telegenic figure in the brash, young, and very online alt-right movement which emerged in the 2010s, quickly gaining international notoriety for her views on mass immigration, Islam, racially motivated farm murders in South Africa, and the supposed harms of liberal feminism content that saw her accused by the radical left-wing Southern Poverty Law Center of racist dog whistling and even hovering at the precipice of outright white nationalism. Southern herself has always denied this, but that hasn't stopped her critics on the left accusing her of far-right agitation. Then, abruptly, she disappeared in 2019 to embrace marriage and motherhood in her husband's home country of Australia. She was, it seemed, all set to embrace the nurturing, feminine, domestic role prom promoted by the right-wing traditionalist, idealized by tra trad wife influencers, and criticized by progressives as dangerous and stupid. Four years later, though, Southern caused a new round of shockwaves, this time with a video recounting what happened next, the breakdown of her abusive marriage. Oh, yeah. Her return to Canada as a single mother, 
and a stint. Wow, I'm seeing some similarities in certain stories, but her return to Canada as a single mother and a stint living hand to mouth in a cabin in the woods. I'm sure she was literally living hand to mouth. <laughs> this is such a fucking joke. Her parents are rich, are they not? Uh, I think she only has one kid, right? I don't know. Southern, you never know. Uh, Southern has attracted vitriolic criticism from the right for speaking openly about how trad life, trad life went wrong for her. She, however, sees speaking out not as a betrayal of her own side, but as continuous with her early, earlier willingness to challenge progressive consensus on topics such as immigration. I'm not worried about saying the things I'm saying right now that are getting me so attacked online because I've dealt with this with South Africa. I've dealt with this with mass immigration. I've dealt with this with my critiques of feminism. And every single one turned out, oh, maybe she was on to something. For she tells me she's not alone. She tells me she knows many other women still suffering in unhappy trad life marriages. One of her WhatsApp, WhatsApp groups, she says, is like the underground railroad for women in the conservative movement. The... Do we have a button for that? <laughs> the underground railroad for women in the conservative movement. Women have every advantage in every way in court, in child custody, in the media, in the portrayal of men as abusers and this and that. And simps just eat that shit right up. I was talking about this, I don't know, a week or two ago. Um, this whole idea that women have it so hard uh, and it's so tough for them and they have to escape like they're slaves and all this shit is complete trash. Uh, they can and will just steal your children uh, and they'll most likely get away with it, uh, to be quite frank with you. Um, now, as far as I know, um, the guy said just take, just go, basically. I don't know that he even cared about that aspect of it. Uh but uh, the idea that women have some sort of disadvantage uh, in society uh, or when it comes to this sort of situation is nothing but fantasy. Uh, and I can tell you from my own personal experience, and I'm sure many men uh, listening right now or listening later uh, can tell you from their own personal experience uh, that this is complete hogwash. Uh, but I'll continue regardless. Some of these are prominent media figures. There are a lot of influencers who are not in good relationships, who are still portraying happy marriage publicly and bashing people for not being married while being in horrendous relationships. She hopes that in speaking out, she can reassure all these women who are thinking in their heads, I'm uniquely terrible and I'm uniquely making a mistake, that no, something is more generally amiss. What then is amiss? In her view, it's not that conservatism is such a fundamentally mistaken, is conservatism as such is fundamentally mistaken or that complementary sex roles are unworkable, but the online trad life ideology has distilled a version of these roles that's both rigid and wildly oversimplified and thus woefully ill-equipped for real life in ways that pose significant risk for women in such marriages. How then did Southern get from posting videos titled Why I Am Not a Feminist to defending women's sex-specific interests within family life? This is, after all, not a million miles from what used to be called feminism. It's a long and bitter story in which Southern did her best to live a purist internet ideology to the letter, only to receive a grim object lesson in its shortcomings. <sighs> Born in 95, I don't know. I'll skip that part. Uh, let's see. I'm, I'm looking through. I don't want to. Let's see. As Southern puts it, follow the listicle and you'll be fine. By the time she met her husband, she'd been con uh, condensing conservative values into listicle form as a media influencer for some years to the point where it seemed possible to realize this framework in real life. So when marriage beckoned at 22, she tells me, Riley, I thought I'd won the lottery. They were married within four months, arguably the equivalent for the right of my left-wing embrace of communes, anti-capitalist demos, and niche sexual subcultures. She was quickly pregnant. There were warning signs from early on. If I ever disagreed with him in any capacity, he'd just disappear for days at a time. I remember there were nights where he would call me worthless and pathetic and then get in his car and leave. But she didn't see them thanks to the simplified anti-feminist ideology she'd absorbed and promoted 
I had this delusional view of relationships that only women could be the ones that make or break them and men can do no wrong. So she didn't spot the red flags even as they grew more extreme. He'd lock me out of the house. I remember having to knock on the neighbor's door on rainy nights because he'd get upset and drive off without unlocking the house. It was very strange to go from being this public figure on stage with people clapping to the girl crying, knocking on someone's door with no home to get into, being abandoned with a baby. But, as she tells me, the nightmare began in earnest when, she was, when he was offered a work opportunity in his home country of Australia a few weeks after the birth of their baby. She did not want to leave her support networks behind, but he used the political and religious importance she'd placed on lifelong marriage as a lever to force her to agree. Whenever I wouldn't do something, he would say, I'm going to divorce you. So, feeling she had no other option, she assented. He also insisted she should publicly quit work. His work required a high level of government security, Fed Clarence. Uh, she was a right-wing provocateur who had faced deplatforming state investigations and was even banned from entering the UK. In their early giddy romance, this had felt manageable. But when we moved back to Australia, he really wanted to get back into his old work, and Southern was a hardcore liability, so the pressure was on. It was like, Lauren, you've got to hire lawyers, you've got to disavow everything, you've got to never talk publicly again. So, in 2019, she announced that she was leaving media and activism altogether. As Southern tells it, she was trying sincerely to put into practice the ideology she promoted in her videos. I believed I had a certain role in my relationship, she told me, and it was to be the more submissive one that supports my husband's dreams. I was told daily that I was worthless, pathetic, dead weight. That's a little subquote there. Then, thousands of miles from friends and family, she reports becoming the closest thing to a modern-day Western slave. Oh. oh, I've heard this tale before. <sighs> With no income of her own, she had to do everything. The lawns, the house, the cooking, the baby care, the, his university homework. And I didn't know anyone. I didn't have any support. There was no help changing diapers. <laughs> there was no help waking up in the night with the baby. I'd still have to get up to make breakfast before work. I'd be shaking and nervous for fear I'm going to get yelled at. Then he'd berate her for spending all her time on tasks other than earning money. I was told daily that I was worthless, pathetic, dead weight. All you do is sit around and take care of the baby and do chores. When COVID shut down all real-world public life, her situation became hell on earth. It was, she said, the only time in my life where I idealized dying. Instead, between the lockdown claustrophobia and her husband's behavior, she began to revise her initial willingness to leave public life. In part, she told me, by the way, there's plenty of rumors and evidence that she cheated on her husband. Uh, and that's really the reason why her, her marriage broke down. Um, but, again, uh, you know, I don't have the direct uh, evidence on that. But uh, we've done shows on that. And I'd actually, I actually was the first one to put that out because somebody had leaked that to me. Uh, and then it was confirmed like a year later. Ralph was right. Uh, and I had gotten that from a friend of her husband's who had told somebody else. And I'd got sent that information. And I put that out publicly on Twitter. And it was confirmed almost a year later, which was last summer. Uh, and so everything I originally reported was absolutely confirmed. Uh, so I just want to remind people uh, about that. But... He was so much kinder, sweeter, and more pursuant of me when I was this boss babe traveling the world working. It seemed like becoming a mother made him lose respect for me. It was shocking to me, again, because the traditional view preached the opposite, that men love you more when you stop working and become a wife and mother. In her experience, though, this was very much not the case. So, a year after retiring to embrace traditionalist domestic life on the right-wing model, she posted her comeback video and began making sporadic media appearances. Never mind the pop anti-feminist ideal of a breadwinning husband and a homemaking wife that Southern had once promoted, the freedoms won by early feminists for women to work and have interests outside the home turned out to be a lifeline. Those already inclined to dislike Southern's politics might feel a certain vindictive satisfaction at this collision of ideology with reality, but arguably, in having, t in having taken so long to see the potential downsides of her own anti-feminism, Southern simply shared the same blind spot as much of, the, much of the mainstream left and right. 
It is surely true that conservative advocacy for complementary sex roles sometimes ignores questions about women's physical vulnerability and the scope this affords for domestic abuse. Conversely, today, many self-identified liberal feminists have also forgotten that the earliest women's movement was grounded in the sex-specific material vulnerabilities Southern experienced firsthand. The magazine pop feminism that I internalized in 90s Britain seemed less concerned with such gritty realities than more nebulous goods such as empowerment, representation, and smashing stereotypes. By the time Southern made her first viral video denouncing feminism, this was still more pronounced and joined by the even more disembodied ideology of gender identity. When the physical vulnerability inherent in becoming a mother gets downplayed across the political spectrum for different reasons, perhaps it's no wonder Southern only gradually came to grasp the practical value of some first-wave feminist victories. But even though she was no longer a dead weight financially, her job failed to appease her husband. He kept demanding I contribute more financially, but then would chew me out whenever I would work. It didn't seem to matter what she did. He would just give me impossible tasks all day, tasks that I simply could not finish. It felt like he would almost send me on errands with the intent of having me fail. Maybe you're just a failure, bitch. Have you ever considered that? That could just be it. Maybe you're just a fucking fail, bitch. Could that be it? I I never hear these women who, and I have several uh, I could think of, pop to the top of my mind. Uh, Maybe you're you're just uh, a no-good bitch. Honestly, uh, have you ever considered that? Uh, I, I don't know if that thought ever ever crossed your mind. Uh, maybe you just weren't up to the task. Uh, maybe you just weren't good enough. <laughs> maybe you just suck. Has that ever crossed your mind? Bitch and other bitch. Maybe you really were worthless. Maybe you really are dumb bitches. Maybe you really were dead weight. Anyway, all of this Southern tells me uh, was, Southern tells me, difficult to square with her religious beliefs. She would pray by his bed, bed when he was angry with her, hoping that if she gave him grace one more time, he'd realize the depth of her love and be kinder. And if this didn't work, she was encouraged to persist by the way online life had led, had conditioned these beliefs beliefs into listicle form but as she discovered distilling religious traditionalism into viral bullet points does not provide an adequate framework for navigating the complexities of a real world marriage she thought she told me that as long as i put on the high heels and the lipstick when my husband comes home as long as i cook the best meal as long as i'm always submissive and say yes sir whatever you want things will go fantastic and if it's not fantastic the listicle version of traditionalism would just say that she should make more effort Maybe you should have made more effort, whore. <clears throat> and not been a whore. That could have been that could have been another thing you could have done too. Like I said, many such cases, by the way. But it was, she says, an embarrassing wake up call. Finding myself consistently applying these rules and instructions I found on Twitter and then never getting the results they were supposed to get in the realm in the real realm of relationships. It seems to me, I tell her, that condensing millennia of religious belief and real-world domestic praxis into viral memes has produced a right-wing gender ideology every bit as oversimplified, dematerialized, and radically disconnected from the complexities of life as the disembodied left-wing version. In turn, both Southern and other women I spoke to within her wider underground railroad of ex-trad women think that perhaps unlike its left-wing analog the extremely online nature of this gender ideology attracts a higher than usual proportion of individuals with existing psychological issues ellen not her real name 35 is another previously married erstwhile trad who is now in southern's network i wonder who all's in her network that That cracks me up to even think about. Please let that be true. She describes how the men who self-select into these communities are often wayward, antisocial, disagreeable, and very, very misogynistic, frequently themselves from broken homes and with limited real-world social support. And when their relationships go wrong, as they often do, the very online trad gender ideology has no remedy. If there's a problem due to the fact that he's crazy, violent, or hateful, Ellen says, that's just how it's supposed to be. So there's really... So there's nothing really done to fix it. 
Southern is careful to emphasize that she knows many traditionalists in happy, loving, complimentary marriages, but she says it's a fallen world, and her community includes many women whose husbands seem to have been drawn to a listicle-style gender ideology precisely because of the power it offers over women. Those guys want someone they feel they can definitely control, who's never going to leave them, who they can do anything to. In the end, it wasn't Southern who broke the spell, but her husband. Around the time her son was toddling, two family deaths prompted her to arrange a visit home to Canada. Her husband threatened to divorce her if she went, and Southern tells me she had to sign an affidavit promising to return. Finally, he relented, only to text after she landed in Canada, declaring that because she'd chosen to travel, the marriage was over. Based. Damn. She moved in with her parents, then into the kind of affordable accommodation available to those on the breadline in Canada's brutally expensive housing market, a cheap cabin surrounded by woodland and trailers. Even then, she still hoped her marriage could be saved. I still wanted to make it work. I was texting my husband and calling him, begging him to get back together, but he just said no. I don't even want shared custody. The cabin, she said, had an ant infestation. Everyone used her when she had it so hard. It was so tough. It was so tough on those food stamps. It was so hard. Oh, my God. It was the hardest thing ever. Oh, man. Ant infestation. Everyone used her washing machine because it was the only one. But she says it was unexpectedly healing and filled with a, filled with a genuine sense of community. Still, it was a confusing time for her. My brain was breaking between two worlds, she says, because I couldn't let go of the ideology. I was at a similar age when I fell away from the radical left and the sense of disorientation she describes is familiar. But where I was free to grapple in private with my cognitive dissonance, Southern had built an international profile promoting this worldview. I had been banned from countries over this ideology, she said. I had destroyed my reputation internationally for this. How am I going to let go of this? And yet, every Manosphere talking point had turned out not to match her experience. It wasn't true that only women mess up relationships. Being submissive didn't fix everything. Yes, women mostly initiate divorce, but as she discovered, this can happen because a man wishes to avoid, to avoid incurring child support liabilities. When she described her red pill conditioned expectations of divorce to her lawyer, the woman laughed at how mistaken she was. More than anything, though, what shattered the listical mindset was simply realizing how much nicer life could be when you live the life that's in front of you rather than trying to follow rigid percepts. Precepts, excuse me. Despite not being the right-wing ideal of aristocracy and everyone going to mass, she realized she was infinitely happier there in that woodland among her working-class neighbors than she had been in her marriage. Every single thing I was experiencing in my realm, not the online realm, was, complete, was the complete opposite of what I was being told. When she first announced her marriage, she says she'd been lauded by friends and fans. Then when she announced the separation, she was inundated with messages lamenting how her life was ruined. But in both cases, the exact opposite was true. Post-divorce, after becoming a single mother, my mental health started to improve. I started to repair all these really important friendships. And I'm living a much happier, much healthier life than I was before. Some of the most miserable people I've met, in fact, absolutely the most miserable people I've met, have been stuck in this weird, LARPy, trad dynamic. The happiest people she knows, on the other hand, are just living in reality. In Southern's view, the increasingly visible gulf between right-wing gender ideology and living in reality has an analog in the memes and talking points of the broader E-right, a phenomenon that, once again, is mirrored on the other side of the aisle. Here, viral and overly simplistic ideas re uh, replicate with seemingly very little refer reference to reality, human nature, or the world as it actually is. For example, she describes the repeal the 19th meme, which calls for ending women's right to vote, as the right-wing version of defund the police. Southern thinks the Internet's baked-in incentives, and I'm going to have to make the hangout soon and send it to Andrew, encourage this drift toward ever more caricatured viral politics. For example, she tells me that where earlier generations of red pill content merely focused on exploiting women sexually, it has become just teaching men to hate women. Well, they... <laughs> I think women teach them that, actually, in most cases. But simply because this is a simpler, cheaper, and more viral message and therefore easier to sell. 
Someone less online than Southern might reply, yes, but surely the error was disappearing into online ideological, ideological rabbit holes in the first place and confusing memes for life principles. This is true, but so much of social life now happens online, including for children, that Southern is far from the only individual to have reached adulthood with a set of templates for life gleaned more from, gleaned more from memes than real-world adult guidance. Nor is this a problem for just one side of the political aisle. Against an online world with an entropic culture dissolving with entropic culture dissolving effects at this scale, then what hope is there for any of us? There are there isn't any for nobody. The world's coming to an end, bitch. A pessimist might say the future looks bleak for interpersonal relations. It looks bleak for everything, you dumb whore. Are you fucking kidding me? It's so tough. It was so tough. But I think Southern story offers cause for optimism. It suggests that maybe, just maybe, our current crop of internet-generated political de derangements will turn out to be temporary symptom, a temporary symptom, driven by generations who grew up without the internet and hence without much psychological defense against its many pathologies. By contrast, the first genera generation to grow up online is now approaching middle age. A great many besides Lauren Southern have road-tested ideologies they developed in virtual space and are finding them in adequate to the real world's complexities. I doubt gender arguments will abate anytime soon. The tussle between men and women is a culture war as old as humanity itself. Men and women always need to find a way to live together, which means negotiating these those ways our material int uh, interests and physical capacities align or exist in tension. With wider folk wider world and with the wider world in flux, it's hardly surprising to find ourselves here again. The challenge is finding solutions that are grounded in reality rather than abstract purist ideologies. But the internet's first generation of narratives of excuse me, of natives, this is a narrative, may be the one who brings us back down to earth. Even the erstwhile queen bee of the extremely online radical right is now a convert to living in reality. So perhaps there is hope that the rest of us and our politics will also find our way back there in the end. And I read that whole fucking article, so I hope to God we hit that goal. Powerchat.live slash the Ralph Retort. Killstream.live slash tip. Fuck Lauren Southern straight to hell with a god... I won't say that. I might get in trouble. Uh... <laughs> Thank you for watching this clip. This is the CACA Bill Fair. Remember to like and subscribe.